I'd like to tell you about the third most important thing to happen in 18th century European history and a defining moment in the history of Poland. So obviously there's no better place to shoot this than a medium-sized city in eastern France, right? and I will explain why in a minute. But first I'd like to talk about 17th century Eastern European history because in the 17th century there were two powers in Eastern Europe, Austria and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which had existed since the 16th century but that had actually been a personal union between Poland and Lithuania since 1386. So this really had been around for quite a long time and it was really rather powerful. In fact, it managed to march on Moscow successfully in 1610 and hold the city for two years. So it is possible to march on Moscow and win. But the glory days of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth were very much the early 17th century. Um, in the 1650s, they were severely weakened by invading Swedish forces, which managed to engulf the entire country. And at the beginning of the 18th century, they started to have other problems. You see, Poland-Lithuania had neighbours in Brandenburg, which later absorbed Prussia, and Russia. Now, Brandenburg had severely strengthened throughout the 17th century and really become quite a bit of a regional power by the early 18th century. And Russia, which had been easy prey for Polish-Lithuanian forces in the 17th century, had just undergone the major modernization program of Tsar Peter the Great. So they were no longer quite such an easy target either. And that is where France comes in. You see, if there's anything you need to know about this period in European history, it's that the House of Bourbon, centred in France, and the House of Habsburg, centred in Austria, really didn't like each other. In fact, this was the main reason why France fought on the Protestant side of the Thirty Years' War, despite being a staunchly Catholic country. By the early 18th century, there were two things that the Bourbons in France really wanted. They wanted to get the Bourbon on the throne of Spain, which they managed to do after the war of the Spanish succession, and they really wanted a friendly state directly bordering Austria to threaten the Habsburgs. This led France to undertake a major influence campaign in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and that was quite useful for Poland-Lithuania as well because it was severely weakened at this point and it would have probably fallen prey to its neighbours but French protection was always there to make sure that Russia, Austria and Prussia didn't really invade Poland because they would be at war with France and France was the most powerful military in Europe at the time. But then King Augustus II of Poland-Lithuania died. Now, Poland-Lithuania had an elective monarchy at the time, which means that it wasn't simply a matter of the throne passing from father to son or mother to daughter, but rather whenever the king died, there would be an election among the nobles to find the next king. And obviously this was ripe for exploitation by other countries. Now the three countries that I mentioned previously signed a secret treaty called the Treaty of the Three Black Eagles, which basically meant that whichever candidate France would propose for the next Polish king, they would oppose somebody else and all join together in opposition to France. France decided to back Stanislaw Leszczynski, who had been king of Poland before, under another Swedish occupation, under Charles XII, 
um, but had then been ousted and he had been living in France ever since, so he was quite a pro-French candidate. The signatories of the Treaty of the Three Black Eagles initially supported Manuel of Portugal to take the Polish throne, but then the Polish Parliament passed a law saying that there could be no foreign candidates, and so they decided to instead propose Augustus III, who was the son of Augustus II, and so quite a natural successor, and really it didn't matter to Russia, Prussia and Austria who got the Polish throne, as long as it wasn't a candidate positive towards France. With tensions rising up to what would eventually become the war of the Polish succession, France started building an alliance of anti-Austrian countries, and they managed to do this. Uh, Spain, which of course was now ruled by a Bourbon as well, joined them, and so did Piedmont Sardinia, who had actually fought against France only a few decades earlier in the war of the Spanish succession, but now started to see Austria as the greater threat to its existence. In response to this, Russia invaded Poland, and that effectively started the war of the Polish succession, but ironically, Russia's invasion was also pretty much the only fighting that actually went on on Polish territory during the war of the Polish succession. Instead, the war would take place on the usual battlegrounds whenever France and Austria were fighting each other, so that's northern Italy and southern Germany. France started out by invading Lorraine, which fell almost immediately to the French armies, and then France moved into Germany, where they were initially quite successful, but then they were halted by a large Austro-Russian army. In Italy, they were a lot more successful, but squabbling between the French and Sardinian forces led them to stop first at Milan and then at Mantua, rather than pressing the advantage and possibly managing to capture Vienna, which wasn't unthinkable. So now we've reached a bit of a stalemate. France really can't advance any further, and Austria is severely, severely under threat by French armies. So Russia is really the only country that stands to win, and to be honest, France obviously doesn't want Russia to win, but Russia's own allies also don't particularly want it to win that much, because it would upset the balance of power. So, peace talks begin. The first thing decided that these peace talks is that the Polish throne would go to Augustus III, not Stanislaw Leszczynski, but Stanislaw would be compensated by being given the Duchy of Lorraine. The former Duke of Lorraine, Francis Stephen, who had been an ally of Austria, would instead get the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, of which the male line was about to go extinct, and Parma, which had been ruled by a Bourbon, would be annexed to Austria, but Charles de Bourbon, who had ruled Parma, would now get the much larger kingdoms of Naples and Sicily, so that was nice for him. However, despite that, and despite gaining Lorraine eventually after Stanislav died, France really lost in this war, because they lost their influence in Poland, and thus in Eastern Europe as a whole. It would only be a few decades after the conclusion of the war of the Polish accession that Poland would be partitioned between Austria, Prussia and Russia. First only part of Poland, but by 1795 all of Poland had been divided and was now ruled by these other kingdoms. It wouldn't be that long before Poland regained its independence, albeit only for a little while. After all, 1795 is quite close to the start of the conquest of Napoleon Bonaparte, and while he was making his way through Europe, he established the Duchy of Warsaw, which effectively became a new Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And that meant that once again, Poland had been secured of its independence by France. Stanislav had also been very popular in Poland, despite Augustus III eventually winning the war, so really pro-French sentiment was quite strong in Poland, and this is probably why about 200 years later, during the Second World War, um, when the Polish people perceived the French as not having helped them enough, after Poland was invaded by Nazi Germany, they really felt that that was quite a betrayal. Not necessarily because of what the French did, but more because of what France and the Franco-Polish connection meant to Poland. Speaking of German occupation, Nancy and all the rest of Alsace-Lorraine would of course fall in the German occupation from 1871 until 1918, and again during the Second World War. However, for all those decades of German occupation and the many, many more years that Nancy belonged to France, all of its most recognisable landmarks really date back to Stanislaw Leszczynski, and references to him are all over this city. It really is quite incredible. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe to Robert Explains, and if you hated it, feel equally free to spew vitriol at your leisure. Until next time.